wonderful Buddhist monk in front of me. We're all part of the chemical dependency get together that started off when Don said, Gus, I can't do it this year. Could you pick up my slack? And I said, sure, no problem. I'll, I have no problem with that. I think it's my way of giving back to the Buddhist community what they've given to me. And I'll never be able to fill that cup. Never. But these gentlemen in front of me, Steve, Jim Rob, and also Chad, Chanel, and this particular gentleman who just asked my, my attention. We're sitting in, in a council meeting and come to find out that for years he's been dealing with the substance abuse problem in Southeast Asia, right outside the Golden Triangle, trying to treat people using meditation and drinking tea. So all of us are going to present today different aspects of how Buddhism has now been engaged as part of a solution to the substance abuse problem here in St. Louis. My particular background is I've spent 35 years in this community working on substance abuse at every different level. Uh, there isn't a level that I've actually missed. Um, I've put together four treatment centers. I've been involved in six treatment centers. I've been the employee system. Oops. Better bow there. <laughs> I've been a part of the Employee Assistance Program for Boeing. I've been involved with the Employee Assistance Program for most of the Fortune 5 countries, uh, 500 companies across the United States. I've been involved in all the unions, UAW, especially the automobile, Ford, Chevrolet, as well as Chrysler. My background started and I used to be able to do this stuff off the top of my head, and I apologize, but I'm at that point in time. Can't do it anymore off the top of my head. Got to have numbers. So you'll please forgive me. My path started off 60 some odd years ago when I got a call from my cousin who wanted me to go swimming at a place in St. Charles called Suntan Beach which is off Highway 94, right out of Washington. What occurred was that Suntan Beach back in the day with St. Charles was very small. Suntan Beach was notorious for at least one person drowning a year. Because when you dove off the high dive, as we knew back then, you would dive into sand or mud and if you could not get out of the mud, you became the facility which made the banner news, which everybody said Suntan Beach has now lost their one person per year. Well, I dove off the high dive, ended up in the mud, and damn near drowned. Thanks to my cousin Alan, who grabbed me and pulled me up and said, do you know how to swim? And I said, no, I haven't quite figured that out yet. <laughs> he said, well, you might want to learn. So when I got home, the next day my mother got a call from my aunt who said, did you know your son did not know how to swim? At which point in time my mother said, well, we really didn't think that was a priority in the boy's life, but given the fact he almost died, we might want to consider that he's going to continue to go out. So to tell that story, what happened was that I went to the local swimmery in St. Charles, and I met up with a swim instructor by the name of Dr. David Ohms. At that point in time, Dr. Ohms, this 
gentleman's laughing because he probably knows Ohm. Dr. Ohm's, at that point in time, was a swimming instructor, uh, not a swimming instructor who was going to Shamanah school. And he said to me after five or ten lessons, he said, you can't swim worth a damn, but you can paddle like all hell, and if you can do that, that's fine. Thirty-four years later, my swimming instructor and I are opening up a treatment center in St. Charles, which was the first treatment center to use what we call multi-layers. Because back in the day, we treated everybody 28 days and you were out. There was no inpatient partial intensive outpatient program to be had. Didn't matter whether you smoked marijuana, whether you drank alcohol, whether you used cocaine, everybody got to stay in treatment. So my life mission at that point in time was started at a young age where I met a swim instructor. 30 years later, I was doing treatment with. By the way, Dr. Holmes is well-known addictionologist, and he's written many, many, many different books. Steve has also worked with Dr. Holmes on an inpatient basis. He's since retired now, but if you ever want to read a good uh, article on the disease concept, Dr. Holmes is your man. Uh, that actually led me after that to my path in Buddhism which started one day when I was headed to high school and I had before I was ready to leave my home on Leonard Drive I happened to see where a couple of Buddhist monks had burned themselves in South Vietnam and I was struck by the fact that these monks were giving up their lives for their belief in the war in Vietnam at the time. I went to a Catholic high school at the time. I went to school that day. And I noticed that all my peers didn't really know how to respond to that in any way. And I don't think there was any appropriate response other than grief and compassion. Um, the sisters that taught us at the time took the time out to explain to us that these people were basically saints and that they had done the most noble of all of these. And that really was the beginning of, for me, engaged Buddhism. But I did not know that until eight years later when I was in Vietnam going down Highway 1, passing a big Buddha that's about the size of the Buddha that's upstairs. If you haven't seen that Buddha, it's beautiful, it's huge. About the south, sitting on the side of the hill on the train that the Vietnamese had put together to commemorate these wonderful monks. At the same time, and I'm getting involved at some level, if you're all getting a pattern in my life. At the same time, as I'm getting ready to leave South Vietnam, I'm involved in working with the first U.S. Army treatment center ever created for the treatment of heroin addiction at Six Convalescent Center. I'm getting together the methadone and helping to create the first center for the treatment of drug abuse ever in the Army. The statistics at that point in time, and I'll round this out for you, there was probably somewhere between 450 thousand, five hundred thousand GIs in Vietnam at that time. Twenty percent, and you can do the math, 
20% of that 450,000, 500,000 were addicted to heroin. 40% had at least tried heroin one time. The Army had recognized this as a particular problem and were beginning, beginning to treat it and do statistics and also when everybody was being discharged through South Vietnam at the time before they got home, if they were addicted to heroin, we were treating them with methadone at that time. And that also became a part of why I'm here today. Treatment in St. Louis has started off years ago, right before the 50s, by individual doctors. Uh, the doctors pretty much would treat the mostly the alcoholics, would treat them, and one particular person, individual, who I knew, his father was an alcoholic, was treated at St. Joe's and St. Charles and told never to drink anymore and make sure he drank a little, make sure he took a lot of sugar on a daily basis and he would be okay. And that was pretty much the treatment. What happened was back in the day when we had state hospitals, and that's long since gone, they would keep the alcoholic or substance abuser for 60 days treatment and then they would discharge them. They also used a form of therapy called transactional analysis. And the, the therapist who did that treatment were so afraid that the people in the state of Missouri would find out that they were supplementing a 12-step program with transactional analysis, that any time they use the, blue, the blackboard to write down the TA information, they close the windows because they were so paranoid somebody would find out that they're supplementing the 12, 12 step program. And that's about the time where the 12 step program came into being, that was AA. As years went by in the 60s and 70s, we had the AA community growing as well as uh, we had a acid LSD problem and there were things like acid rescue that was being used at the time. And if you went to a concert, most oftentimes there would be people who were either having bad trips or whatever and people would come in to um, treat them using acid rescue and that along with AA was part of the self-help. When I got involved, what was happening was, and that was about 30 some odd years ago, 35 years ago, was that the state hospitals were no longer doing treatment. And that companies like Care Unit Hospital would come in and they would do the treatment of the standard 28 days and refer out to AA. When I started, all we had was AA. A couple of months after I started, <clears throat> they started Narcotics Anonymous because people in AA didn't feel like their program fit for the narcotic abuser. So NA started at that point in time. And then, about a year later, cocaine became a problem and it started off with CA. Cocaine's anonymous. So now you had three different 12-step programs. And now from what my friends tell me, because I've been retired a little bit, they now have a heroin anonymous, along with refuge recovery, which, which will be discussed. Facilities like Christian Hospital were one of the first facilities here in St. Louis to begin to offer an outpatient alternative because what we were discovering was that people did not necessarily need a full 28 days worth of treatment that some people could actually if you're smoking marijuana you don't need to be 
in a hospital for 28 days. If you're using cocaine, you may not need to be in a hospital for 28 days. You may need a longer outpatient stay. So we began to rethink this. And as we were rethinking this, the insurance companies came in under managed care and said, we're going to help you make sure you rethink this in a proper way. So residential stays began to leave. Detoxes became important. Partial hospitalizations, where you only had to stay most of the day, became available. An intensive outpatient with a referral out to the 12-step program became the norm. And that's where we stand today. Now, these gentlemen that are sitting up here that have been invited to talk today, the Buddhist community with their focus on mindfulness and the focus on meditation have become a part, have joined as part of the treatment of substance abuse because they offer what is not being offered in 12-step programs. And that is they're offering that alternative of using your mind now. The 11th step of the 10th step, I can't remember which one, actually by Bill W. talks about using meditation. But the key is real meditation has to be learned, in my view, from someone who knows how to do meditation. And when you have 2,500 years of studying your mind, you might want to consider the fact that you would want to go with somebody in Buddhist, Buddhism that understands how that works. So in St. Louis, the Buddhist community has grown and grown. Mindfulness has grown and grown to the point where I'm sitting, picking up a prescription of wall means, and I see three books, magazines on mindfulness. Next to the three magazines on mindfulness are three, ma three magazines on marijuana talking about the benefits of medical marijuana. Uh, two, three and three next to each other. Refuge recovery is part of a program that's been started for those people who feel that the 12-step program is not working for them. But they have a place to go that they can use principles, mindfulness, and meditation. What Steve is offering is Steve works at center point and thinks outside the box and says, okay, why don't I try to use the bells Try to get to think of all like part of the chemical dependent to slow down and focus. Back in '51, when the Blue Book was written, of AA it said alcoholism or disease is an obsession of the mind and an allergy of the body. You use heroin, you don't have to worry about the allergy of the body. Heroin in and of itself will take care of it and get you addicted. But if you have a predisposition, it'll make it worse. Now I'm going to end this because I promised I wasn't going to stay up here too long. I told them, give me five, expect 10 and get 15. <laughs> Anyone who's interested in, in real good addiction, psychology, philosophies, go to the internet and look up chapter 5 of the big book. It's got everything you need to know about addictions. And although 12-step programs have been the treatment of choice over the years, 
It's in chapter 5 where you find the wisdom. And here's some of the wisdom. There is no such thing as an easier, softer way. No, no, not for addiction. No, no such thing. And every addict who's been down that road will tell you, we've tried the easier, softer way. It's not going to work. You need the support. And as a Buddhist say, the reason you need to go and hear about addictions is the mind will forget over and over and over. And you need a daily, if not hourly, dose. No such thing as an easier, softer way. It's cunning, baffling, and powerful. When you step into this arena, you better know that you're up against something that's more powerful than you are because you'll make that mistake and you'll die. And threatening someone, and having done impatient, I say, all levels of care, I can tell you looking at somebody and saying, you're going to die and never scared anyone. Half measures of all this nothing. We stood at the turning point. So thank you, gentlemen, for being with me today in France, for answering this. Thank you. And Chanel, thank you for showing up. There will be a question and answer after this, and she will be joining us up here. So I'm going to turn this over to Steve. Again, thank you all for showing up today. I hope you enjoy it.